Greetings, everyone. Dr. Brian Scott with you again on another Insight to the End Times podcast. Thank you for joining us today. We have been examining, as you probably know, if you've been following us, where are we on God's timetable as we approach the end of the age? I was inspired to do these uh, podcasts about two years ago, over two years ago, uh, to put some perspective on life and where are we spiritually speaking as we approach the end of the age. Uh, Even people in the world, um, not church people, but people in the world who have very little, if any, uh, biblical knowledge or, or church background are aware that we're getting closer and closer to the end. The doomsday clock, as I mentioned earlier this week, um, they, they indicate that we're 60 seconds to midnight, we're 70 seconds to midnight, we're 40 seconds to midnight. It's kind of in that range. It varies from time to time. But it's within a minute or two of midnight, which means we're very close to what they consider to be the end. Most people know the term Battle of Armageddon. They don't necessarily know who's involved or what's involved or any of the details of that. Uh, We're only able to speak about it as the Bible explains it to us. But we do know it's the final battle before Jesus Christ returns to set up his kingdom on the earth, which is for a thousand years. And then there's all kinds of things that happen at the end of that thousand year period. But preceding his return will be seven years of tribulation. And uh, we are on the verge of that. Now that's when the Antichrist is revealed. And we're seeing aspects of the Antichrist every day. Um, The Antichrist is anti-Jesus Christ. Uh, Satan is anti-God. The false prophet in the book of Revelation uh, who appears during the second half of the tribulation period, he's anti-Holy Spirit. So Satan mimics and mirrors what God is all about. And um, so we have believers, we have non-believers. We're getting closer and closer to the end. Paul wrote Timothy two letters, first and second Timothy. He passed, Timothy pastored the church in Ephesus. We get the book of Ephesians from from, uh, that. He's also referred to, the the church in Ephesus is also referred to in uh, Revelation two and three as one of the seven churches that Jesus writes to. But the point I'm getting at is that when Paul wrote Timothy, he pointed out to Timothy in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy that there are a lot of signs concerning people's behavior and their beliefs and the way they act that will define perilous times in the last days. We're very close to those perilous times. In fact, we're in perilous times already. But... We're on the very verge of these last days coming to a close. We've been in chapter 3, verse 3, for the last uh, couple episodes. And um, on Monday and Wednesday of this week, we were looking at number 12 on the list, which is without self-control. And we looked at a lot of different factors that show that we no longer, as a society or as people, are exercising self-control. We've lost our boundaries. We lost our restraints. We're in much more of a anything goes mentality. Uh, I want to move on to number 13 on the list in chapter 3, verse 3. And it's brutal or fierce in the King James. We're seeing a lot of brutality in our society today. And um, the Greek word <clears throat> that is translated as fierce in King James or brutal here in New King James, versions of the Bible, could be described as follows, cruel, cruelty, fierceness, harshness, savage, violent, or violence, viciousness, uncivilized behavior. Uh, Isn't that where we're living? We're living in a time of cruel, fierce, harsh, savage, violent, vicious behavior from people. Uh, It's amazing. Now, back in the days when 
Paul was writing this letter, Paul had been, he was Saul before he became Paul. He was Saul as an unbeliever. He became Paul as a believer and, and one of God's uh, generals, an apostle. But he enjoyed selecting Christians to be put into the uh, arena, the outdoor arena, where the vicious animals would tear them into, uh, into shreds. He also enjoyed the barbaric sporting events where gladiators would fight one another to the death. There were no holds barred. So anything would go in those settings. Uh, broken bones, flesh flying everywhere, etc. It was extreme, vicious, harsh, cruel, savage sport, if you can call it sport. Now, we don't have that kind of thing necessarily going on today where we have gladiators in a ring or in an arena, but we do have TVs and we have internet. And what we're seeing on our TV screens and over the internet today is of a very, very similar nature and character. We're seeing violence and vicious savagery, savagery, savagery and it's more pronounced than it's ever been before. Do you realize that the more you see this, the number you get, N-U-M-B-E-R, you become numb to it. It no longer moves you. It no longer affects you. It no longer causes you to be concerned or upset. So more, the more vicious and the more nauseating the news, the more conditioned you are to that as normal, or we might call it normalcy, and the further we are removed from its impact and its effect upon our society. Here's some facts that I dug out for you just to back up what I'm saying to you. Uh, I'm not blowing hot air. Um, this comes from experience. This comes from research. This comes from extensive studies. But by age 18, an average teenager or we might call them an adolescent, uh, they have viewed more than 200,000 violent acts on TV. And they probably have seen over 40,000 simulated deaths on TV or murders. It happens all the time. Even in their cartoons when they're really young, even in the uh, um, video games they play, it is commonplace. It is common practice. It is what they rejoice in. My statistics may be a couple years old, but the last statistics I was able to, or the most la the latest statistics I was able to dig out showed that kids. These are kids, not just teenagers, but kids are playing at least four hours of computer games or video games a week, a, a, per day, sorry, per day, four hours per day. 50% uh, of them contain violence. They prefer fantasy violence games. This is a proven fact. Fantasy violence video games are so real that military experts declare that we are teaching kids to like killing. So we wonder, why is there all this violence in our society today? Why are young people, adolescents, young 20-year-olds, why are they committing such horrible crimes and they're using weapons and they've got guns and they've got knives? Why? Well, they've been watching this on their screens for years. As kids f averaging four hours a day of violent games and, vision and, and uh, video games, playing these video games where the killing is so realistic that they adopt this as a, 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 a this is the way life is. And if they're playing these games, they receive points every time they kill another figure on the screen. So it's 
we're conditioning them. We're conditioning them. Today's uh, music that is so popular with younger kids, especially what we call rap music and some of the harder rock type music, if that is still in vogue, it, but it's filled with violence and it's filled with uh, um, violent actions, violent words, violent activities. Here's a statistic again that just blows uh, our thinking apart. But a teenager will listen to over 10,500 hours of music from grades 7 through grade 12 much of which will be of a violent nature. Now, I grew up quite a few years ago, and um, I remember getting my first uh, record player. A lot of kids don't even know what a record player is. But I remember getting my first record player, and the long play, the LP records that were available, were of um, musical uh, movies um, that had soundtracks, like The Sound of Music, as a for instance, and uh, other, other shows of that nature, other movies of that nature. Then they had the, the smaller discs, the 45s. Those were current hits. And um, one, of the, one of the biggest sellers in, the, in, the, in my earliest years that I remember was Elvis Presley. And my mother wouldn't let me listen to him because it was too uh, carnal. It was too uh, secular. It was too uh, anti-Christian. Um, when the Beatles came along, my, my parents wouldn't let me listen to any of their music because they were long-haired. When you think back against what's going on today versus then, are we talking, we're not even talking the same, we're not on the same planet. We're an entirely different planet now. Um, even in Christian music now, which is coming out in rap form, it is atrocious. So we've got a desensitization occurring of brutality everywhere. It, 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 it's like, wow, it's everywhere. Um, violence in the in media today will lead to violence in real life today. To deny that that's the case, uh, folks, that's like denying that gravity exists. It, it's a foregone conclusion. Um, the interaction between uh, males and females. Um, the respect levels are not there anymore. Brutality is, is, is my gracious, it's everywhere. Um, it's absolutely everywhere. So we have a couple of illustrations of this in the scriptures. Um, Abraham and his nephew Lot were told by the Lord to leave the land where they lived and to go to a new land. And when they arrived at the new land, um, they had to separate because they had their, their flocks, their herds, and so on, and they were so, so wealthy, and they had so much that uh, Abraham went one side and Lot went the other. Now, Lot selected the lands called Sodom and Gomorrah where the grass was extremely luscious, and the expression, the grass is greener on the other side, comes from this situation. And... What did, Lot didn't realize was Sodom and Gomorrah was evil. And the evil was beyond uh, anyone's comprehension. So when we pick it up in the book of Genesis, um, God sends two angels to warn Lot that he's about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of its brutal brutality, its evil, its wickedness, etc. And when these two angels arrive, Lot takes them into his home, 
and the men of the city are sexual perverts, homosexuals, and they come knocking on the door wanting to beat it down, demanding that Lot send these two angels out to them so they can have sex with them. Now, here's Lot's response. He's a dad. He's got, um, he's got uh, daughters. Uh, if I recall correctly, he has four daughters, two married, two who are not married, two who are referred to as virgins. That means uh, they have not had sexual relationships. They are uh, young girls. I don't know their age, um, other than they're referred to as two virgin daughters. He says to these uh, brutal men who, who are fierce and perverted, <laughs> he says, I, I can't send these two men out to you, but I've got two daughters, and I'll send them out to you, and you can do whatever you want with them. What kind of a father says that? What kind of a father thinks that? Well, uh, one who's been exposed to so much filth and degradation and brutality and perversion that it's become a th way of life. It's become a thought process. He's, he's lost his marbles, in other words. And God does send down fire and brimstone and destroys all of Sodom and Gomorrah. And only Lot and his two young daughters escape. Uh, pretty serious is issue. It's a... It's what we call in Scripture a type and shadow of what's coming during the seven years of tribulation. We have another illustration in Scripture in Genesis chapter 6 where God is describing the lifestyle and the society of Noah's day. And in this situation, he's referring to the fact that there's so much evil and so much wickedness and so much corruption that he has no choice but to destroy everything. And we're told, or we've come to know through our studies and research, that there were millions of people on the earth at that time. God wipes them all out because of their brutality, their way they operate. My goodness, they, women were allowing uh, fallen angels monster angels to have sex with them and, and their offspring was, was weird, really weird. Well, let's talk about, as we wrap up today, where are we in our society today? We are in extreme brutality. Um, the um, abortion is an issue still. It's a huge issue. This is death to the unborn in the womb of the mother. And uh, let me give you some statistics to show you how widespread this is. Um, from 1957 through 1991, when the USSR collapsed in 1991, that 34-year period, uh, it is reported that over 306 million babies were aborted in Russia. Over 306 million. Folks, that's huge. The population of the United States is around 345 million today. In that 34-year uh, period, they uh, killed 306 million unborn babies. China is even worse. From 71 through 2020, a uh, period of 49 years, sorry, uh, 39 years, China allowed... Um, 490 million abortions. That's the entire population of the United States, Canada, and Mexico. In the United States, since uh, 1973, in the Roe versus Wade decision, there have been over 62 million abortions. In the 1980 through 2020, 40-year time period, worldwide, over 2 billion abortions. This is brutality, brutality, brutality. Now what are we dealing with? We're dealing with euthanasia. In Canada, it's called MAID, Medical Assistance in Dying. It is expanding from terminally ill patients and excruciatingly uh, pained patients to mental issues. They're talking about moving it into the teenage years and so on. This is euthanasia. This is gaining great 
strength and, and energy, and it's becoming more of a worldwide issue. Paul said in these last days, there will be perilous times. And we not only see it with our lack of control, self-control, but we're seeing with the brutality and fierceness that is becoming commonplace in our society today. And if it's not occurring in your backyard, you're not aware of it and you're not concerned about it, but you ought to be because it is a surefire sign that we're on the very verge of the very last days of life's existence as we've known it. Next week, we'll continue. We're going to get into some more things, and uh, it will be a, I hope it will be a trust to you, a help to you. Amen. I'll see you then. Have a great weekend. Call you blessed. Amen. Amen.